Hi, this is Jermaine. Welcome to another episode of The Story of Us. Today I have one question for you. Do you love your body? I'm not talking here about only uh, your body size or your height, but I'm talking about your shape, your curve, your teeth, your hair, your finger, your nails, everything. Do you love your body? And today I have my beautiful friend, Karen. We are going to address that topic today. I'm so glad having you. <laughs> I'm so today. happy we are finally sitting down to do this. In fact, we've been talking about this for so long. You ready? Jeez. Oh. <laughs> to the conversation. Finally. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I can. I was born and raised mm. in Southern California mm -hmm. in the United States. And... My husband and I got married after college back in 2000, hmm. and we hopped around uh, living in a variety of different places hmm. in the U.S. until 2007, when we made this wild and crazy leap to go to Japan. <laughs> and it was just supposed to be for one year, hmm. maybe two, if we really liked it. Uh, but we ended up staying there for 10 years. Mm. Our son was born there. And we founded our own international Montessori school during that time. And then the most incredible offer came a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to study food and mm. cooking in mm. Italy. Mm. So we sold it all and left Japan and hopped on over to Italy. Mm. And while we were there another opportunity popped up in London and then in Mexico. Mm. And we sort of accidentally fell into this digital nomad lifestyle mm. that we've been leading now for the last seven and a half years or so. And I know that you are also a yoga instructor and you are also... In fact, you have so many. <laughs> in front, we say cascade. You have different hats. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about that? I do. I wear lots and lots of hats, and mm. I love all of them. <laughs> so, yes, I am a certified yoga teacher mm. as well. I've been practicing for more than 25 years. Mm. But during 2020, mm -hmm. with the lockdowns and everything, I was continuing to teach cooking like mm. I had been for years. Suddenly, lots of people were at home and had time. <laughs> and what I was noticing was there was a certain discomfort with all of the fun stuff mm. that I was used to really engaging and enjoying mm. with people. And it turned out people weren't having as much fun mm. as they typically had been. And as I was digging deeper into what was going on, more and more of the questions, the disturbances that people were feeling kept coming up over and over again. Basically, there were just a lot of people who were having difficulty sitting with their own thoughts. Mm -hmm. The confinement, not being able to go anywhere, not being able to engage in the typical distractions was really is still hard <laughs> for a number of people to this day. And I realized at that point that the yoga that I had been practicing mm. for so long mm. had really instilled with me a lot of very helpful tools mm -hmm. for managing the emotional discomfort at the time. And so I made a concerted effort to put my nose in the books once more and study so I could get an official certification, mm. and really back up the teaching that I wanted to share with others. Incredible. And I just want to come back on how we met. <laughs> I remember we met because, I don't know who invited you, like I started a it dance was class. Yes, Jennifer. Yes. So we, I, I, I had an Afrobeat dance class, the mm -hmm. Afrobeat dance class, and they were like, that was actually the first or the second session? The, it, oh no, it that wasn't was the, the first one. That was the was. third one. Okay. And then you came as soon as I saw you and I, I, I greeted you and, you, and I You're knew... Like, oh, another black person. In <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I mean, it's relatively <laughs> unusual. People ask all the time. Like, yes, there are other black people in Albania. Hey, it's yeah, not just sure. two of us. But I think 
um, you display just such a great energy. As soon as I, 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 I hold your hand, I'm just like, I need to see this, pe this person again. And I think I asked you out and I say, hey, can you, do you want to take a coffee with me sometime? And you said, yeah. I remember yeah. thinking exactly the same thing. We had such an immediate connection yeah. during the course yeah. of the class. And yeah. I just, I loved the way that you conducted the class, mm -hmm. really drawing people out during the course of it. It was so much more mm -hmm. than just dancing. And we had so much fun. I was like, mm. I got to hang out with this chick. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I am so excited to discuss this topic with you mm -hmm. because I've always been impressed by your confidence. <laughs> you know, you're different, but you're also very confident. I think you are among the only, if not the only woman that I know that doesn't have different type of dresses, shoes. You have a tiny closet. You mean different types of dresses and shoes. I mean, what I mean. Um, you say you don't like my boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but you do not fit in the standard of the society. But no, yet, not at all. <laughs> you're bold. You're beautiful, and you're extremely confident. Um, you. you are black and chubby and beautiful and confident human and i'm just want to know how how do you do that like because i'm how? absolutely insane <laughs> no it, honestly um it's a journey that i have been mm. on for many many mm. years and it's been honestly a process that has gone through a lot of different iterations um, but it really sort of became intentional mm. after we left the United States. And looking back on our journeys all over the world now, I can see that having that very specific geographical separation from the context in which I was raised, the mm -hmm. societal strictures that I had just come to expect and anticipate and accept as the norm, it allowed me to really reevaluate a lot about myself mm. and going to a place like Japan, mm. <laughs> another continent, another language, another everything, you know, where there weren't very many people, well, like here in Albania, <laughs> that look like me. Mm -hmm. It really gave me the freedom to stop trying so hard mm. to fit in mm. Not just to try to blend in the way people do, you know, not stand out, kind of looking like everybody else. Because I just didn't look like everybody else. Obviously. <laughs> but because I wasn't a part of the society in which I was living, I was automatically pegged immediately on site as an outsider. Mm. I got to enjoy the freedom of my outsiderness. Mm. And <laughs> I heard a phrase many years later that really resonates with me to this day. And it just, it said something to the effect of, why would I try to fit in when mm. I was born to stand out? Mm. Wow, and that's beautiful. something that I, I like really that. embrace I like now. That. Because I was born to stand out. And having the, the freedom to live in a cultural context mm. in which I'm not expected to blend in. I won't ever blend in has really given me a little bit of extra confidence to just embrace mm. standing out. I remember you shared with me at some point that uh, you used to live um, a life when you were in a corporate. You used to wear <laughs> high heels. Yes, I did. You know, wearing I started wearing high things. heels uh, in elementary school, oh, actually. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I got my first pair of high oh. heels when I was in, I want to say... Fifth, it was in fifth grade. Fifth and sixth How grade. How old were you? I was, I wouldn't have been more than about 10 <laughs> years old. But I imagine you, you 10 me, old ten old me on heels. <laughs> it was, it was lovely. They were beautiful little red <laughs> heels. Aww. But it was because of a role that I had mm. in a stage play. Mm. And I was supposed to be Glinda, the good witch of the north. And I needed to sing. And, and my question will be, at what point exactly is it when you travel that I because uh, there must be a, a turning point where you just decided 
I can you recall that exact moment or like an even or experience there something been that several happened? Several moments, but I think it's funny that you mm. asked about the shoes because shoes were one of those kind of aha moments for mm. me. Mm. I have big feet. Mm. <laughs> I always have. In mm. fact, as a child, you know, we used to tease each other on the playground. Mm. At your age, not your shoe size. Well, seriously, when I was nine or ten years old, those were literally the same thing. I have big, I have big feet. Mm. But I've never been embarrassed about my feet. Mm. That's just the way they are. That's the way they grow. And that was something that was predetermined from far before I was born. Mm. Um, but I have always had difficulty finding shoes. Mm -hmm. And so this process, even of getting those heels for mm -hmm. that first stage production, was a challenge. Because finding something that fit me, that was appropriate for what I was looking for, It's a tough thing to find, especially mm. as a child wearing adult sizes. So I was excited to get heels because finally, that's what most of the shoes were mm -hmm. back in, this was in the mid 80s. Mm. And so I got excited when I had a chance to find some heels, which is what I'd wanted to wear, what I needed for this specific purpose mm. and what was actually fitting me. And it was one of those wild moments when I was like, mm. why can't it always be this easy? Mm. Why can't I just get what I need, and be done with it. Mm. Thinking back on that uh, later, I had actually a very similar conversation like that with a young Japanese child. I'd been in the country for maybe two years at the time. And I was teaching these little mommy and me um, circles at local community centers. And after class one day, one of the little girls, she couldn't have been more than like three or four years old, she came up to me and she asked, she said, Karen Sensei, why are you so big? <laughs> Children <laughs> don't have filters. No, no filter no whatsoever. Filter. <laughs> she saw me yeah. sitting next to this tiny Japanese woman that I was co-teaching with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was literally like wow. twice her size. Mm -hmm. She's like... All these Japanese women are this size, and Karen Sensei is this size. Yeah. She's like, why is that? So she came and asked me. Mm. And I said, because that's the way God made me. And it was that simple. And as I was explaining it to her, mm. it clicked to me. It's like, duh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the way I was made. Yeah. Yeah. I was doing this way. About that, that's very funny. What something that has really marked me mm -hmm. when we were out shopping one day, do you yeah. remember? And as we were fitting clothes. Oh, and yes. you told me a sentence that stayed in my mind. Mm -hmm. You said, you realize at some point in your life that mm -hmm. it's not your body that had a problem. That's the cloth that has a yes. problem. If the cloth doesn't look good, change the cloth. Thank you. If the body doesn't have a problem, Don't. the cloth has one. And when you think about mm. the fact that we as women have this tendency mm. to discuss our bodies mm. with respect to the sizes of the mm. clothing mm. that we purchase... People talk all the time about, you know, I need to mm. drop a couple pounds so I can fit into this dress or this outfit or whatever. And I don't, sometimes I feel kind of silly, really, when I mm. think about how long it took for me to think about the fact that clothing is mm. adjustable. There are literally whole scores of professions within the fashion industry yeah. of people making and adjusting clothing mm. so that it can be customized to fit on our bodies. Exactly. Why on earth? Would we starve ourselves and over-exercise and do all of these things that we do to try to change our bodies mm. when there's mm. a whole industry around changing the clothing? Mm. And one thing also you mentioned, if I remember correctly, uh, I don't know what was the occasion, but you just mentioned that, but it stayed mm. in my mind. You said, it's my body, I cannot change it. And that's, it's something we need to have in our mind and keep it, it's your body. Mm -hmm. The way your legs are, your your hair, your nails, you can change it. It's it's your body, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you you didn't choose it, so what do you do now? Mm -hmm. um, that raised a question in my mind. Um, is there a period of your life where when you you didn't really love your body and what okay. was your experience, how, if you remember about that? I... I honestly look back with a lot of sadness mm. at some of the things that I did in my younger years. Um, I 
couldn't have been more than about seven or eight years old. That's you. The first time I received a direct message, there was something wrong with my body. Mm. And it was from something that you would have expected to be a helpful Mm. source. It was a book Mm. that was supposed to be about health and learning to get to know your body. Mm. But in this book, I, I will never forget this either, it asked young girls to take their hands, put their thumbs together behind their back, and wrap their fingers mm-hmm. around their waist. And it said, are your fingers touching? If not, you've got work to do. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so my waist is supposed to be this big? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and this was, like I said, I mm. couldn't have been more than seven or eight years old. And Can you I recall the year this. 19? That would have been, like I said, mid Eighty early mid eighties, and you have to set up the context that was in United States. It was in the United States, yes, mm. and deeply embedded in diet culture. Mm. I look back now, and I can see how pervasive mm. so much of the messaging was that we got socially mm. back in the eighties and the nineties. It's still pervasive today, mm-hmm. but I can see it for what it is now. But I didn't see it at the mm-hmm. time. That was a clear message, though, that said, if my waist was larger than the span of my hands, then I needed to do something to fix that. I Mm -hmm. needed to shrink Mm -hmm. my body. Mm -hmm. And that was exactly what I saw women all around me doing. Mm -hmm. I would go with my mom sometimes to her jazzercise classes. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was fun because, you know, they were playing upbeat music and the women were dancing around and having a good time. I just thought it was fun. I didn't realize that the women who were going to those classes were working hard Mm. to burn off the calories that they'd been counting, that they'd been consuming all day. Mm. Or this was back in the time when when we were drinking products like Tab, Mm. which was like one of the first of the most awful tasting diet soda. (laughs) And I watched my mother, who went, tortured herself, suffering through diet after Mm. fad diet after fad diet, eating only grapefruit or... Speaking about diet, one thing I've realized is that um, we're not talking here of unhealthy weight, but I've seen people who cannot be smaller, you know, Mm -hmm. they're naturally chubby. I I know people who have been chubby all their lives Mm -hmm. and -hmm. they have grown up chubby, whatever they do, Mm -hmm. they are that way. Um, they're, They're still here, like, they're not obese, but they're chubby, you know what I'm saying? And they will not... Yeah. People come in different shapes and sizes. Mm. And we have this misguided perception mm. that because we're people mm. and we all have the same skeletal mm. frame, mm. that our muscles, our flesh is supposed to wrap around mm. our bones in the exact same way. Mm. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I mean, you would think yeah. that we would get that knowing mm. that we look at people's faces. We all have a skull, mm. but the shape of our face, the color of our eyes, the length of our hair, all those things are different. Exactly. None of them look the same. and We don't try to make them all exactly mm. the same. Mm. Why should we try to do the same thing by inflating our breasts or shrinking mm. our waists mm. or, you know, whatever it is we're trying to do to make ourselves look better? Mm. <laughs> you know, Coming it's ridiculous. Back to when you were young, um, I also know that back in your time, mm-hmm. uh, having straight hair was oh also something, yes. right? As a black yes. American. Yes. Uh, yes. Was it, wh- how was it, did you see other women having their own hair, their natural hair, or was it no. like a trend to only have? And how did you feel about that? And yeah. I never really thought about it. Mm-hmm. Get, uh, by the time I was about six years old, um, I had already been through multiple processes of heat straightening. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> Black American women will know. <laughs> exa- they'll be able to smell what I'm talking about. And I talk about the blue magic and the sizzle of the hot comb on the stove. I mean, it's torture. Literally Ooh, yeah. taking a metal yeah, comb, yeah. putting it on the stove, heating it up with that electricity, and then pinching Ooh. the hair at the back of your neck yeah. and getting that, tss, yeah. that sizzle as you burn and, and literally mm. sometimes burning mm-hmm. the scalp, the back Just of your neck, your ears, hair. to have straight hair. But 
when I was like six years old or so, mm-hmm. that was when I graduated to the chemical relaxers. And then there was a whole different kind of burn, mm-hmm. but literally putting these toxic chemicals, yeah. smearing them all over our head, burning ears and scalp in order to get straight hair. Because, and again, this was unfortunately the culture at the time mm-hmm. that said that the way that our hair naturally grows out of our scalp, just mm-hmm. like this, was wrong. Mm. It was unkempt. It was not beautiful. It was unprofessional. Mm. It was it was just bad. Mm. And the only way to make it acceptable was to straighten it. Mm. And then here's the weird thing. <laughs> I didn't even think about this so much before, but after straightening, then sometimes people would still go and add curls, <laughs> big round curls, so that you could have like a big curly it was it was like in the shape of a fro yeah but it was straightened first and then curled again it's wild right yeah so wild but again this was the messaging Mm. it came from every corner and i was a pregnant adult living in another country already before i ever thought Mm. to question that and at that point it was only because as i was looking around our house and i was reevaluating what was it going to be like to bring a baby mm. into our home? And I thought, I don't want to have these toxic chemicals around an infant. Mm. And only then did I stop to think, well, what about all of the generations of people who came before me that didn't have access to these chemical relaxers, mm. that hadn't been told mm. that their hair was unprofessional mm. or unkempt or whatever? What about the generation, the centuries of people before me mm. who let their hair grow naturally out of their heads. What did they do? Mm. Okay. And so I just stopped. And I've never been so thankful because as soon as my baby started crawling, we were in the shower one day and he reached into my conditioner and stuck it in his mm. mouth. But at that point, I had already gotten rid of all the chemicals mm. and all he was tasting was some whipped avocado that I like, <laughs> in the kitchen. So it was perfectly safe. <laughs> Good. You know, speaking about hair, it's um it's something that is very popular in Cameroon, mm-hmm. where I'm from particularly. Uh, ladies used to wear a lot of wigs. Mm-hmm. And now mm-hmm. there's a new trend of, like, it's from real hair, you yes, know, yes. having wigs. And you have the real one. Mm-hmm. You wear it like Indian, and that's what is proper. Actually, mm-hmm. I, I haven't wear, I, I don't think... I was I have ever wear wigs like a real one, mm-hmm. but I used to put um, another type of wigs like plastic. You we were sorted oh, like yes. something with yeah, your hair, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> and or also maybe use braid. And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the first time I traveled to Iswatini, I was I was there for a year, and then I don't know one day I was just tired of the same circle of. Oh, this story. Okay. One day I have like my hair on and I had a wig, okay. but it was not from a natural hair. Okay. I had a wig and usually I will put my wig because I don't want to leave my hair. One of my roommates, two of them, they actually hide my hair wig. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they did because they wanted to, I don't know. She just wanted to see was, what you were going to do, how you were going to react. She was keep on saying, I don't want you to wear that. Outside. Oh, that's my wig. <laughs> and I was just like, where's my wig? Where's my wig? And they hide it. And I look it, but finally I found it. Mm-hmm. But that rose a question in my mind. Mm-hmm. It took a lot of money also to reach out to her each time with bread and everything. And mm-hmm. one day, this lady came because I was still with uh, with an organization we were living all together. And the sister of one of our teammates came in. She had dreadlocks. Mm-hmm. And I look at her. Oh, first, when I was in Mozambique, I used to see a lot of ladies. I was in a car with uh, a friend from Mozambique. And I was just like, oh, where can I find the material of all those ladies that I see on their hair? He said, mm-hmm. no, it's their hair. Yes. I was just like, <laughs> I didn't so you believe it. seen locks before? Like, I mean... This is what you're wearing now for people who yeah. aren't familiar with the style. But in Cameroon, it was not something famous. Oh. Like, in Cameroon, if you wear dreadlocks, b- back then, that mm. would be, you know, not very main- well-maintained. You'll okay. be, like, strange. 
But when I travel in Mozambique and all the southern part of Africa, it, it's a thing. That you got to it's, see a lot more of it, yes. And I thought it was a material, mm -hmm. and I was just like, why can't I have it? He said, no, 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 that there, I'm just, <laughs> no, I don't believe you, of course. <laughs> but in Swatini, then, I saw a lot more people, and that was the hair. And this lady came, and I asked, oh, where did you do your hair? Mm -hmm. And... She said, oh, there and there, I found her, her beautiful. I found out she was beautiful with her. The day I decided to turn dreadlocks, that was a spontaneous decision. And wow. I know, I, I didn't take the time to say, oh, yeah, should I, should I? I just decided I'm going to turn dreadlocks instantly. instantly. And That's that amazing. was one of the best decisions of my life. I am so glad that you're happy with that decision. I know people yeah. who agonize over it mm. for months years even mm. and have worn locks for a while mm. and then even change their mind mm. and take them out or lengthy process mm. of mm. taking them out or sometimes just cutting mm. them off and shaving their head mm. and starting over um, I have flirted with the idea of locks <laughs> on occasion even twisting my hair like framing my face or just a couple yeah. on the side Usually after a week or two, I change my mind and I take them out. Yeah. But I have also worn wigs <laughs> and um, smaller hair yeah. pieces. I've had weaves. Yeah. Um, I have worn braids. Mm. And I learned how to do mm. a lot of this stuff myself. Mm -hmm. After, uh, when I was 18, I left Southern California, went to school in New York. And that was like a whole new world mm. opened up for me. And I had to learn mm how to take care of my hair mm -hmm. all by myself. And I was fortunate to be in a place where there were some other black women around that I could go to for some advice. Mm -hmm. And I remember like the first time I put the chemical straightener on my yeah. hair by myself and I burned my ears so badly because I'd missed the spots to cover up yeah. and protect them. Never forgot that again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that was a very I'm painful done. lesson. Yeah. But yeah. again, all of these things were what I was thinking about as I was reflecting on the changes mm. that I went to make when I was pregnant. And I looked back and I was like, wow, you know, not only did I waste a lot of time, mm. but I wasted a lot of money. Mm. I literally injured myself mm. painfully to the point because... I thought that that's what I needed mm. to be beautiful. Mm. And as I was focused more than anything on bringing this new child into the world, all of that stuff was completely wow. meaningless. Wow. Totally and completely meaningless. I am really, really curious to know what was your experience in high school. I know high school is the time where you question a lot mm -hmm. about yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, like, what was your perception of your body when you were in high school? How did I you thought prepare? I was fat, mm. <laughs> which is hilarious because I look back on some of the pictures, especially as high school friends and um, people who, like, you know, still have those yearbooks or whatever have sent me pictures over the years. And I'm like, what was I thinking? <laughs> I was not. Um, but I was constantly comparing myself mm. to other people. And I went through a period, again, beginning in elementary school, where I was always one of the tallest people in my class. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, the children used to call me and one of my close friends the Twin Towers because <laughs> we were literally Kids towering can be over so everybody nutty else. Sometime. And I yeah. didn't have a problem with my height. Mm -hmm. Like I said, even then, I used to wear heels. Mm -hmm. But... I always was told that, you know, I was bigger than everybody else. Mm, and yes. I could see that I was bigger. Bigger than some of the other people on the sports teams mm -hmm. that I was playing with. Bigger than, you know, the other girls that I was in class with. Bigger even than my other siblings. Mm. And there was always, like I said, you know, this idea that it was my fault. Mm. And I needed to do something about it. Like mm. everybody, all the other women around me too, which is why there was this fad diet and this sugar-free food. That was another huge thing. The mm. food at the time. Mm. There was lots of um, sugar-free stuff, or fat-free stuff mm -hmm. rather, that tended to be laced with sugar. But then there was also um, lots of reduced calorie things mm -hmm. and counting calories and even weighing or measuring out foods and keeping close track 
these were all some of the things that we were encouraged to do to make sure that as if eating was a mathematical equation. Mm -hmm. You take the number of calories that you put into your body and it has to be this and this and this and not that or that or that. And then what comes out is this slender, beautiful body. And it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Something is coming in my mind. And how was the reaction or what was the reaction of your household? What was your mother telling you about your body, your hair? Was she encouraging? Because I had an experience. I, I knew of a girl. She was uh, chubby also. And she was so complex also because unfortunately her mother was not helping. Her mother mm. was constantly reminded her how big she is, how mm. she needs. And I and as I think of that, a young girl, she was mostly in the state of depression because mm -hmm. she thought she's, she wasn't beautiful, she mm. was big. And her mother, I think her mother was just displaying the complexes that she already has on her child. And I'm curious to know um, how was your mother with you about that and do you think that you have kept some trauma about the relationship with your body and how your mother was perceiving or what words your mother was telling you by that time? I don't recall any specific words mm -hmm. like directed at me from my mother. Um, I do remember though that my mother was incredibly dissatisfied with her body. Mm. And so whether or not she said anything directly mm -hmm. to me, her actions demonstrated mm. what she was focusing on, what she was prioritizing at mm. the time, mm. which was shrinking herself. And that set the example that I was trying to follow, to mm. live up to. I was trying to copy what she was doing. So when she started this or that fad diet program, I wanted to try that too. Mm -hmm. I thought if that's good for her, that should be good for me. And that's what I was thinking again while I was pregnant with my child. Mm. What kind mm. of an example do I want to set? Correct. Mm. And so I've focused hard on making different decisions. Mm. This year you have celebrated 24 years of marriage. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and one thing came in my mind from the story you have told me. Um, your husband and you, you met, I, I, I believe, when you were still in that style of life, worrying about hair. And I just want yeah. to know, how was the shifting for him? <laughs> to see, you know, this lady who is always having beautiful hair, your hair amazing i mean artificial hair mm -hmm. high heels but suddenly yes. becomes somebody else dressing so oh, like how is the transition and how so, is he keeping okay, up i have with to it? say that my husband has the patience of a saint <laughs> because some of the ways in mm. which i must have tortured his ears <laughs> with my complaining over mm. the years i mean i used to go into the process of uh, straightening my hair, mm -hmm. reapplying the chemical relaxer, which I'd have to do, you know, every like four to six weeks with so much dread mm. and complaining. Mm. And it was often accompanied by just repeated moaning and groaning of, oh, I hate my hair. Oh, I hate my hair. Oh, I hate my hair. Seriously. Mm. That's what I used to say out loud repeatedly over and oh, over wow. again. And because it was painful, mm -hmm. because it was literally a painful process. And so then when I started experimenting with some other things, um, a friend had recommended a kind of natural relaxer that mm -hmm. was not supposed to have the same harsh chemicals, mm -hmm. but it was still supposed to straighten my hair. Mm -hmm. It didn't. <laughs> it was a disaster. And he heard me going through that process and expressing the frustration. I got to the point where I used to say, you know what? I'm going to cut my hair just like, I'm just going to shave my head. I'm going to be bald. Mm -hmm. And he would be like, Okay, whatever. Oh, wow. And like I said, patience of a saint. Mm. And then as I was trying, you know, lots of other protective styles or literally just covering up my hair, like tying scarves and things over my head, um, he always just looks at me and he says, you're beautiful and I love you no mm. matter what. And it's because of that kind mm. of unconditional support 
that I have felt really comfortable mm. to explore a variety mm. of different options, including eventually just going mm. with my natural curls. Mm. <laughs> That's something that I'm thinking about because there are um there there are a lot of ladies outside there who still want to feed because sometimes they receive pressure in their marriage sure. uh, from their partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, not only with their weight, the way they look, we have this um, joke, like the lady after marriage and the lady, yes, of, yes. Uh, I mean, before marriage <laughs> before and, and after. after. But yeah. it's, um, it's a constant struggle for ladies. I have the impression, unfortunately, like, especially in Cameroon, the mindset is the lady always has to be perfect, you know? Mm-hmm. She has to do all the things in the house, yes. taking care of the kids and all do everything. Still be beautiful, have a flat stomach after mm-hmm. giving birth to five, seven <laughs> kids, have a flat stomach, be right. perfect. But guess what? The man he can, can gain weight yes. and have a ridiculous stomach. That's fine. You're the lady. You, you need to keep beautiful. And that brings and, a lot of and pressure. And why is it? Mm. that we have that societal expectation because trust me that's not just in Cameroon Mm -hmm. it's not just in the U.S. Mm. why is it that we have this double standard Mm. for men and women when women going through that process of um, Mm. getting pregnant Mm -hmm. literally growing all human being Mm. inside your body and then expelling that human being Mm. it changes you physiologically I mean there are things now even, you know, more than a decade after having had a baby, Mm. there are changes in my body Mm. that I can feel to this day. Mm. There's a distinct before and after Mm. having carried a baby. Mm -hmm. And just like I'm not the same human being Mm -hmm. that I was 10, 20 years ago, my body functions differently Mm. now. So it doesn't make any logical sense for me to expect that it should be the same shape and size that I it was when mm-hmm. I was a teenager. Mm. I'm a different person. I have gone through so many different things. Mm. And the physical form mm. that carries me through the world right now mm. is more reflective of that. I just want to raise a point here. Mm. We're not saying you should not take care of yourself. No, not at take all. Take care of yourself. Be beautiful. <laughs> do sport. Do work out. But one thing I want to mention is do that for yourself. That's it. Be beautiful for yourself. And so when I talk about things like eating Mm. and exercising and all of those very physical things Mm -hmm. that affect our physical form, I tend to use words and language that are a lot different from what we hear in Mm. diet culture today. So rather than, you know, like I was saying, keeping close track of calories mm-hmm. in and, and um, exercise, mm-hmm. you know, the calories burned from exercise or whatever, I actually teach people to play with their food, mm. to experiment with a variety of colors and textures and temperatures and preparations and having fun with the process. Mm. Because one of the things that I had to do, one of many things that I had to do in order to be able to heal my relationship with mm, my body, I love that. was to heal I my relationship that. with food. Mm, mm. And that was a really complex thing. Like mm. I said, not only did I grow up in a household where my maternal role model was constantly dieting, but we also had the issues of food insecurity. Mm. And so... It's a really strange kind of balance to try to find when I, I'm hungry and I want to eat and I'm being told either, no, you shouldn't eat that, that's bad, or you know you don't want to eat too much, or actually, sorry, there's no food. <laughs> that's a really, like, that's a lose-lose tug of war. Yeah. Yeah. And so getting to know just what it is that I like and learning to listen to my body. Mm. about whether or not I was hungry Mm. or even whether I was full when I would have this abundance that is available to Mm. us now because we're leading a different kind of life Mm -hmm. and we have more resources available than I did when I was a child. Having access to all the things and being able to say, you know what, it's okay, I can put some away and have some later or I can have more tomorrow Mm. or next week. I don't have to inhale it all right this instant because Mm -hmm. there's more where that came from. Mm. That was a huge leap 
for Mm -hmm. me. And it was the same when it came to movement. Because for so many years, I tortured myself Mm. with the kind of exercise that I thought I had to do in order to burn calories and, you know, to try to slim my body Mm. and reduce my size. And all the while, I was ignoring some of the things that I loved to do, that I enjoyed doing, that made it fun for me to move my body. Funny fact about you talking about your body, you are able to do something Incredible things with your body. <laughs> I've always been pretty athletic. You're so flexible. Like I, I, I'm I saw actually not you. nearly as flexible as I used to be. I saw you on that high skating. Oh my god, yes. the figure you did, <laughs> and you. That's what one thing I said. You always impress me. Like so, how okay. you carry your whole body like <laughs> no you do s- ever expect it, me mm. in this big black round mm. body mm. to go spinning on the ice yeah. in my figure skates or to balance on my head yeah which i've done since before i ever knew what yoga was mm. just playing around as a child i think that comes also with the confidence you already have here Oh, there is absolutely With a confidence your body, in it. Because, yeah. But that's a confidence mm. that is earned mm. over time because I have taken a long time mm. in this mm. joyful movement mm. that I enjoy now mm-hmm. to get to know my body mm. and what it likes doing, what it's capable of doing. Mm. And I enjoy exploring the edges of what I can do mm. and doing that in a way that is satisfying, that is fulfilling just for me. Not to show or prove anything mm. to anybody, mm. but it's because that's what I want to do. Exactly. You mentioned relationship with your body, and I love that. I remember a friend of mine, um, he always tells me, like, get naked. Yes. <laughs> Stare yourself in the mirror. Uh-huh. Just keep on looking at yourself. And yeah. it's something that I've done. <laughs> like, before me, I have a wide mirror in my bathroom. <laughs> and, you know... I, I am on that journey also. Like, mm-hmm. as you said, I think it's something we should be conscious about definitely, to actually definitely. decide to get into a relationship with our body. We have to, a relationship, but it's yeah. often a very abusive one. Exactly. And again, yeah. because it's socially acceptable mm. to berate people mm. or to make fun of them or to shame them for growing in size, mm. and it's socially acceptable to compliment people for shrinking in size, Mm. it's something that we start to incorporate into our self-talk. And I don't often share this with people, Mm. but it can be not just mentally or emotionally harmful, Mm. but it can literally be Mm life-threatening. I lost my father several years ago to cancer. And... What really angered me about the process of him seeking and eventually trying to get the help that he needed was that when he went to see his doctor and he was explaining about the pain that he was having inside, one of the first things his doctors did was to measure his height and weight. Mm. Now, I get my height from my father. He was 6'3", mm. <laughs> played basketball in college and in the Marine Corps. And so he was a big dude. Mm. <laughs> but as he got older, you know, he also got a little bigger around the mm. middle, too. And when his doctors compared his weight, when he came complaining of pain from what it had been previously for another health exam, they basically blew off his complaints. They said... It's probably just something digestive, Mm -hmm. but your weight's going down. So whatever you're doing, it's probably fine. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll be okay soon. And the cancer was literally eating him Mm -hmm. from the inside. Mm -hmm. And he was told, you're losing weight, Mm -hmm. so it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And his complaints were ignored until it got to the point where they couldn't do anything Mm -hmm. for him. And that makes me so, so mad. Mm -hmm. Because if all we are going to do is look at the shape and size of people's bodies and make assumptions, mm. then we're going to find out just how wrong we are and about we health. Do. Because we can't see we health do. from yeah. the outside. And we do make a lot of assumptions. When do. we see somebody chubby or big, 
we think that oh because they eat a lot or do exactly. they but that's only exactly. assumption and it's that assumption true. is so harmful mm. because people in larger bodies are then assumed mm. not to have eating disorders mm. or uh, irregularities yeah. or anything because obviously they're eating too much and what they have to do mm -hmm. is eat less and so that causes people to literally starve themselves exactly. to over exercise and those things are harmful to our bodies mm. and so when I say that we have to you know work to heal that relationship it's, that it's about treating yourself mm. the way you would speak to a child mm. that you love, a mm. loved one Beautiful. that you care for, yeah. that you want to care for themselves. Mm. Mm. And so, yeah, that exercise about standing naked mm. in front of the mirror, looking at your physical form and with gratitude, mm. with love, with appreciation. I was not able to do that mm. until I became pregnant mm. because that's the only time society tells women it's okay for <laughs> you to be big and stomach. round and I was looking at my yeah. growing stomach going oh my gosh this is beautiful mm. and it was getting bigger than it had ever been before mm. and suddenly it clicked I'm like I could have been this happy with myself mm. the whole mm. time mm. and that was a major shift mm. for me as well mm. and so from that moment on I have been working to heal mm. my relationship with my body and I think yeah you're so right I think the confidence with our outside comes with the healing inside, how you reconcile. Absolutely. Um, I think I've really started to take seriously the relationship with my body, mm -hmm. actually, starting last year, you know. Um, looking at my body and acknowledging, and also today with social media, oh, with yes. influencers <laughs> and, and models and movies, yes. like, yes. you can see there's always two different type of body only two mm -hmm. tiny and big yeah. and they are they are even now modeling for big but mm -hmm. one thing people neglect it's, it's not only about height or weight but also shapes yes we yes. have so many different body shapes exactly. you know you have exactly. flat buttocks tiny legs but in the movie you will always see the same side right. and these also um, brings a lot of complex, you know. It absolutely does. And it's one of the key reasons that I started taking lots more photos and videos mm -hmm. of myself in my yoga practice. Mm -hmm. Because as a black yoga teacher, as a teacher in a larger body, mm. as a practitioner who's older, <laughs> I'm going to be 50 on my next birthday. Yeah. And part of what we tend to see, the media representation... Mm especially mm. when it comes to things in the health and wellness yeah, space. Yeah. But yoga in particular mm -hmm. tends to be small, mm. thin, able-bodied white women who are super, <laughs> like, hyper-flexible, contortionist women. Uh, exactly. Seriously. And exactly. I'm not suggesting that there's anything wrong with mm -hmm. people who are walking around in bodies like that, mm -hmm. but that's not the only mm -hmm. image. Mm. And so I'm making a concerted effort to expand the representation of what people see mm. so mm. therefore what they mm. think about when it comes to yoga because the practice of yoga mm. first of all the physical asanas are just one of the eight limbs but it's so much more about the way that you feel mm. in the postures not about the way that you look mm. and so by giving people an opportunity to see somebody in a bigger a rounder body somebody will say oh i can do that too. Exactly. exactly somebody who is not so flexible that they're constantly doing the splits or putting their foot behind their head or whatever mm. else is that people expect yoga is about mm. then they get an opportunity to see that it's something more accessible it can be more approachable like you said it's something they mm. think oh maybe i can actually do that mm. because they can if you had the opportunity to look at your young self today mm -hmm. What will be the words <laughs> that you will tell to your young self? The same words that I tell to my students now, mm. that I tell to my own child, which is that you are perfect, exactly oh, wow. the way that you are. Wow. You are beautiful. Wow. You are amazing. Mm. You are an incredible miracle. Mm. 
Am I and am I, I your yellow self? You, you are. You are. Because I want to tell you the same thing. I want to tell everybody the same thing. And I, sometimes we have to hear it yeah. over and yeah. over and over again. Yeah. Because for all of the positive stuff that mm. comes in, mm. like the negative stuff, yeah. it has like twice the impact. Mm. And so when you think about all the yeah. years yeah. of conditioning yeah. with all the negative stuff, yeah all the negative self-talk mm. mm. we've got a lot of catching up to do to get people exactly. to believe the positive let me tell you a funny story so i i i didn't know this until i was like i have this good friend of mine back then i was crushing on him mm-hmm. and i used to talk a lot with him and then he would look at me and he would say Oh, no, one day we were having a conversation. I don't know how we reached that way. And then he said, oh, so you think I do not find you attractive? I said, no. Mm-hmm. He said, and he told me, why do you think I'm, all, I'm always staring at you? I'm always staring at your face. Uh-huh. Uh, like, uh, and he said, See, yeah, I find you very attractive. I think you're beautiful and you're attractive. Did you believe it? I, like, I thought that was, that will not... But the next day, mm-hmm. when I went to work and I was dressing and I was working, like, huh. <laughs> I'm beautiful. I'm attra- and then I realized that um, how important having somebody else in our life to affirm us mm-hmm. on our body, the way we look, it's mm-hmm. so important. Um, unfortunately, and fortunately, at some point, I didn't grow up in an environment where I was always appreciated. Life was already tough, you yeah. know, yeah. for maybe my mother to focus on affirming and also we didn't know all this. And I grew yeah. up with more masculine energy, like I'm yeah. the only girl. Yeah. I never had sisters. Like yeah. I've never done girly stuff with <laughs> my and I had brothers and none of my brothers, as I can remember today, has ever looked at me and said, Jeremy, you're beautiful. Ne- mm. Never. You are beautiful. Oh. Stop no, it. Serious? <laughs> Look at me. You are beautiful. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. You know, um, and I think I've read some statistic about a relationship with a lady and her father. It's always important, maybe if you are in a family, to get that affirmation. And I realized that. It takes sometimes also other human beings to um, kind of affirm. So if today if you have friends, family members, keep on affirming them. Yes. And the same gentleness that you have towards others, do it also to yourself. Exactly. I've started like a routine. I will look at myself in the mirror. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, <laughs> you're beautiful. Yes. If I was not me, I would have dated you. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, though. And that's what I like doing yeah. to really affirm mm. my female friends mm. on social media. Mm. You know, when people are mm. chatting or mm. you know, sending messages mm. or commenting on other yeah. people's photos. Yeah. Yeah. I love doing that, too. Yeah. Leaving lots of hearts and saying, hey, gorgeous. Exactly. Because mm. so often mm. when we hear that as women, mm. it tends to be from people with an agenda. Ex- exa- and exactly. I think that's part of the reason that we don't often believe it. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. I think it can be helpful mm. to hear it from our loving sister friends, yeah. from uh, totally and completely biased, yeah. but loving people in your yeah. life that you know don't have an agenda, mm. who just want to, like you said, reaffirm mm what I hope you already know mm. and believe. Exactly. Yeah. So, which is strange also, nowadays with social media, it's not happening. Like, I have an example. There was this, uh, there's this Thai actress, you know, mm. she always have six parts, you know. <laughs> bah, bah, bah. <laughs> yeah. She takes pictures. And, like, a lot of us, we will look at some, oh, yeah, she's beautiful, beautiful than me. She's... Mm-hmm. And I was so shocked. To realize mm-hmm. that actually the six part mm-hmm. is not from hard work. It's Shiriji. From, it's from what? Uh, um, oh, surgery? Surgery. Yes. yes. <laughs> I was like, you know, and... Yeah. Those oh, are wow. some of the extremes, yeah. though, that people will go to to make their physical appearance mm. match what they think the societal expectation mm. is. And we're only hurting 
yeah. ourselves mm. and the people who view that. And yeah. they think, oh, well, that means I have to do what that person did exactly. so I can look that way. So we can fit and be... Um, I, I, I cannot imagine how much of us are looking at ourselves every day because we do not have the same body shape of models and mm-hmm. everything. And we think that we're not beautiful. But I love the fact that you said at some point you have one body and you are perfect. You are. The way you are. Just the shape that you have is perfect. Here again, we want to make a balance. Uh, we want to make the balance not having oversized weight, unhealthy weight for your health, you know. But hey, here's, here's the thing that really gets me. Mm. You <laughs> expressed amazement at all of the different things yeah. that I do. Mm. And I have been blessed to be able to study and learn and practice lots of different mm. things. Mm. But what kills me is that imagine how much more mm. we could all do yeah. if we spent all the time, all the energy, all mm. the effort, all the money, all the focus on improving our minds, Mm. our creativity, with sharing our gifts with the world, Mm. rather than trying to shrink our bodies Mm. to fit some model mold Mm. that externally Mm. might be aesthetically pleasing to some people. It's it's just, it's such a waste. And I don't want women, Mm. especially women, I don't want anybody, Mm. Yeah. To waste their time and their energy and their efforts on something as meaningless Mm. as their physical form Mm. when they could be doing something that's more meaningful, Mm. more personally meaningful and gratifying Mm. to themselves and for the betterment of society. Mm. Mm. If you had an advice to give to people who are struggling with themselves, who are struggling with the weight, the body shape. Mm-hmm. Also, again, I'm, I'm really insisting on body shape because it's not only about weight, you know. Yeah. I, I talk about that because personally, I've always have a complex about not my weight, but mm-hmm. my shape. Sure. How my sure. legs are not like as perfect <laughs> as the model. You know, I'm sure everybody can oh, look in the arms, mirror and they have some yeah. body part that they would prefer to change or whatever. Exactly. And the what question is, be, why? Exactly. What would be the advice or the practical steps you may give to somebody who is struggling mm-hmm. or has an abusive relationship? I love how you pointed it. Mm-hmm. Has an abusive relationship with the body. Throw away the scale. i don't need a scale i haven't in years yeah whatever numbers might pop up if Mm. i step on that instrument they're completely meaningless in my life meaningless so and the scale is just one aspect Mm. but whatever those things are that are keeping people immersed Mm. in diet culture i encourage them to get rid of it it could be a food scale it could be you know the food journal like keeping track of, mm. you know, what they eat or mm. calorie. Uh, lots of the kind of nutritional information mm. that's on packaged foods or in recipes that tells people, like, how many calories, if that's something. that Hide that stuff. Mm. Don't look at that. Mm. The key has to be to start turning inward. Mm. To taste the food. Mm. And decide if you're eating it because you actually enjoy Mm. the way that that tastes. Mm. You enjoy the way it makes you feel Mm. when you eat it. Mm. You enjoy the energy Mm. that it imbues within your body Mm. when you consume it. Mm. To go out and do whatever sort of physical activity, participate in sports, go for a walk, a Mm. run, whatever. Because you feel good doing it. Mm. Because you enjoy the movement. Mm. Because you like the way you feel Mm. afterward. Mm. Not because you think that's what you have to do. Mm. To burn so many calories or whatever. Mm. Or to work off whatever it was Mm. that you ate before. It's not a zero-sum game. Mm. There is no perfect mathematical equation of calories in or calories burned. And in all honesty, I mean, when people talk about luminaries like 
the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Mm. Or Maya Angelou. Mm-hmm. Is anybody concerned <laughs> with what number was one? on the scale <laughs> when he stood up to give his speech? Yeah. Yeah. Or when she yeah. wrote her award-winning yeah. book? Yeah. No. Yeah. Because it's yeah. meaningless. Mm. It doesn't matter. Mm. And when we step back and we recognize that that simply is not important, mm. then we have the space to actually refocus and mm. reprioritize on things that are important based mm. on what we truly value. Mm. And it's usually not that superficial. Amazing. I want you to think of somebody directly. I want you to have um, a moment of affirming somebody who is looking at this podcast. Okay. You're going to look at the camera you're going to affirm a young person mm -hmm. who maybe doesn't have a healthy relationship with the body mm -hmm. and you're going to affirm them. <laughs> you are an absolutely amazing yes, you human being. Mm -hmm. You are beautiful. You are radiant. You are a joy to behold and I am so thankful that your light is illuminating this earth thank you <laughs> thank you <laughs> amazing that thank you so much that was such an interesting conversation and I'm I've learned like I've always learned with you and I really enjoy um, discussing this topic. Let's say I want to hear more from you. I want to know what you do. <laughs> Where do I find you? <laughs> Where do I see you? Well, I am making a concerted effort mm -hmm. to show up regularly on social media. <laughs> so Facebook, oh. Instagram, YouTube, mm -hmm. you can find me. Uh, and all of those links are directly connected to my website at mm. Our Kitchen Classroom. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's see on, fast, on Facebook. What, what's your name on Facebook? How do I it's follow you? Karen mm -hmm. M, like Mike, mm -hmm. Ricks, R-I-C-K-S. And on Instagram? Same thing. YouTube? Yeah, same thing. Ha uh, hashtag Our Kitchen Classroom. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, so uh, we can... Oh, and I actually have two oh. different... YouTube channels. Oh, okay. There's the cooking channel and the yoga channel. <laughs> yes, because we can come for you not only for yoga, but for coaching, also yes. for kitchen classes, also what that I've <laughs> left out. So, yes, I teach cooking. Mm. Um, I teach yoga. Mm. I also mentor and coach mm. um, yogis who want to become mm. yoga teachers. Again, mm. working to expand the representation mm in the yoga community and i'm going to be hosting a yoga retreat Speaking here in that. albania later this fall so for people who are looking to imbue themselves mm. with that same self-love to find mm. that inner boldness to really set themselves free from the shackles that have been holding them back from achieving their biggest dreams we're going to come together And we're going to explore some of the different things that might have been holding you back so that you can emerge your most bold and beautiful and free self. So I hope you'll come and join us. <laughs> When was that and where will it be exactly? It's going to be in the south of Albania, in the southern part called Saranda, mm -hmm. which has some of the most gorgeous beaches. <laughs> It really does. Um, and that's going to be this fall in September. <laughs> What date? Uh, it's the last full week of September, the mm -hmm. 22nd to the 28th. And you can find all the details at ourkitchenclassroom.com. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I will surely be. You have your first participant. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for this interesting conversation. Should we change you? Thank you. Again? Yes. To many more such conversations and to teaching and sharing the joy with the rest of your audience. And I will <laughs> surely have you again on this podcast.